And welcome back to the Sports Hour on Flow FM. It's time to talk about a rather interesting article that uh, both the Flow Man and myself read on the weekend regarding the Barassi line. What's it all about? It was part of a, well, it was an interesting article that we read and we thought that we've got to find out more about this and talk to you folks out there about it as well because I think it's going to be relevant in going forward, especially in relation to our regional clubs right across our flow network throughout SA Victoria and in New South Wales. The article we read was in uh, theconversation.com and the author of that article is a lecturer in sport management at Deakin University and he joins us now, Dr. Hunter Fujak. G'day Hunter, how are you doing today? I'm well, thanks for having me. It is a pleasure. Thank you for, for spending some time to talk to us about the, the Barassi line. So for the uninitiated, what actually is the, the Barassi line? Yeah, the Barassi line is a, a, a sort of phenomena or a, a term dubbed in 1978 as this sort of cultural dividing line between football preference uh, in our Australian population that runs from Eden in New South Wales through Canberra up to Broken Hill and up into Arnhem Land and basically just divides the country in half based on what our individual football preferences are. Well, when I look at the actual plotting map that you've got created here as part of the article, it's more of a case of a two-thirds, one-third when I look at it. And uh... Yeah, it is. Um, it very much splits. Obviously, Australia is a very yeah. big country and the south, uh, southwest takes up the biggest chunk from a yeah. geography perspective. But if you break it down on a population perspective, it actually almost works out to 50-50 because New South Wales and Queensland are yep. the more populous states. So population-wise, it, it comes quite close to 50-50. Um, just looking at it though, is is there ch- when I look at the map and I see some pockets of red in some traditional sort of uh, blue areas, and uh, I don't see a lot of blue in the traditional red areas. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a whole interesting backstory to how our footy codes became popular in various places that we could spend a whole hour talking about. Um, in essence, you know, where football is popular today, whether it's AFL or, or rugby, um, is almost close to the opposite of what it was in you yeah. know, 1880 or 1890. So Perth actually played rugby for a few years before yeah. um, Aussie rules came around. Again, Tasmania played soccer and rugby before Aussie rules came around. And in uh, Brisbane, the first game of football was actually Aussie rules, not not rugby. So okay. the map we have today doesn't reflect where we started. Yep. But undoubtedly, there's more red now because Australian rules administrators over the past 150-odd years have been much more proactive in trying to expand the game nationally. nationally. Uh, joining us uh, with us uh, is uh, Dr. Hunter Fujak, the lecturer in sport management at Deakin University. And Hunter, uh, one of our, our sporting gurus here at Flow of M is the Flow Man. He's into the studio right now. He's also got some questions to ask you about this article that we read on the conversation and also about the book. We should point out that as well, Wayne, uh, that uh, Hunter has written this book called Code Wars, The Battle for Fans, Dollars and Survival, which is a very worthy read mm. that we need. So, And this article uh, that we read in the conversation is based on that. Yeah, it's a good article. Uh, and uh, Hunter, a question that, that comes to mind for me is, do you think that the investment by the AFL in, in effect, um, trying to extend the Barassi line northwards, do you think that's had any impact, um, Hunter? Do you think that investment's working for them or are we seeing just a moderate crowds still in relation to those attending the Games? Yeah, I mean, it's the first thing to point out is that it's been a significant investment over a significant time horizon. So, you know, Australian rural administrators as early as, you know, 1910 was already investing money northward, so taking the profits from the VFL and from South Australia and reinvesting those into footballs and jerseys into Sydney, um, for instance. So, you know, they've been, they've been at it for about 130 years, and, in, you know, the last um, 10 years or so, they've pumped in about an extra $200 million into the Swans, Giants, Suns and Lions. So we're talking really big numbers. Um, Has it been worth it? Um, I think, you know, looking at the ratings and the crowds probably isn't quite the level to look at. For me, the more interesting thing is around junior participation um, and and general interest. And from that perspective, we can look at the Sydney Swans Academy and see how many um, quality, you know, AFL players are coming from New South Wales and Queensland as proof that, I guess, at at a sort of grassroots level, the code is definitely advancing in the north whereas Rugby League in particular hasn't really seen particularly many um, athletes come from outside its traditional heartlands. And in fact, they probably struggle more from a participation base um, as the sort of Barassi line moves northwards. 
Okay, when we saw the uh, late 90s, uh, the Super League uh, with rugby begin and uh, the idea that Adelaide would have a side and uh, Perth would uh, have one and that that this uh, game would become more a national rugby game, has that had any impact um, in, say, we've seen the success, obviously, of the Melbourne Storm, but has it had any impact in South Australia or in Western Australia? Is there likely to be another attempt, say, from uh, the national rugby bodies? Well, what's really interesting is that, uh, you know, in that period of time when there was the Adelaide Rams and the Perth Reds, they actually achieved very strong crowds for their time and by comparison to the Sydney rugby teams. So, you know, they weren't really failures from that perspective so much as victims of the circumstances of the Super League War. Um, You know, I think Adelaide, unfortunately, is very low in the hierarchy of where there will ever be an an NRL team because certainly Perth is ahead of it, a second New Zealand team is ahead of it, and there's even been a recent push to think about a Papua New Guinea team or a broader Pacifica team as well. So um, I think Perth is very much at the top of the queue, but South Australia, not so much. OK, what about the Riverina in New South Wales? You're talking uh, the article about uh, Wagga Wagga being uh, kind of like the place where uh, it all sort of divides almost. Uh, the rugby league still is prominent, but AFL has a couple of competitions, the Farrah and uh, the Riverina Football Leagues are based around Wagga and then obviously to the south of there, the Hume Football League uh, towards the border. Uh, is there any likelihood of any change that you can foresee of the Barassi line moving southwards with rugby league taking a more prominent place uh, uh, up uh, in say the Farrah type competition or even further north to that uh, Riverina comp that takes in uh, those great Danahers from Hungary and so on. Is it likely that we'll see any change there? Yeah, so I mean, what's really interesting is that the code wars per se have been going on for you know at least 120 years. So in some ways, it's, it's quite remarkable how little the Barassi line has really moved, given you know how long the codes have been sort of fighting for, as I say, fans, you know, participants, and, and for eyeballs. Um, so in some in some senses, we can think of this as a very slow moving beast. Uh, one of the really interesting things about the Riverina is that. It's the fact that people in this area play so many of the different codes that is what makes the area so successful in producing elite athletes. So this was called the Wagga effect by the Australian Institute of Sport, that because this region has people who play you know, a multiplicity of various sports rather than specialising in just one or the other, that's how they've been able to produce people like Mark Taylor, Michael Slater, you know, Wayne Carey, Paul Kelly, you know, Peter Sterling, the Mortimers, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it would be a great shame in some senses if one code was to become dominant in the Riverina because it's the fact that, um, you know, everyone plays such a variety that helps it become such an incredible powerhouse of sport production. So it wasn't your lack of goal-kicking ability, Flo, man. It's the fact that you weren't in Wagga. That's, 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 that's why you didn't have a great career. I should have played rugby league, I think. I've got enough weight for it now, that's for sure. But is there is there such a thing now with, say, female participation in both the league and also in AFL? Is there going to be any change that you can foresee with, say, female participation in what's traditionally been a male-dominated set of sports? Absolutely. I think this is one of the big, as I talk about in my book, one of the real big battlefronts is sort of the procurement of elite women athletes. Uh, as, as women are more incentivized to continue going up to higher levels of elite sport, um, the whole base of available athletes will grow with time. But at this moment, you know, there's definitely sort of a shortage of elite female athletes relative to the amount of sports who are trying to capture them as players in their leagues. And, you know, for the moment, we're still seeing a lot of cross-coders. There's a, there was a, a lady who played for Carlton Blues who signed for the Parramatta Eels, which is such a crazy novelty to think of, you know, crossing over from mm-hmm. ASL to NRL. Um, and, you know, obviously cricketers can swap over with AFL as well. And we've seen, obviously, between the rugby codes, cross-coding as well. So at the moment, we're still at a phase where at the professional level, women can still jump over across the codes. But that's very much going to erode with time as the codes get more professional and become more full-time. And especially if we think about a thing like the AFLW, you know, when we think about ruck women who need to be of a certain height, ideally, um, you know, there's increasing competition between netball and Australian rules for those athletes. And that's a particularly interesting tension to think about because obviously at the super netball level, there are the Collingwood Magpies and the GWS Giants who are aligned to AFL clubs despite being in a netball competition. And then we know that regionally um, in places like Victoria, 
it's more common to have Australian rules and netball clubs as one type of club mm. who, incre- you know, historically may have had the men's playing the football and the women's playing the netball. But increasingly, there's going to be these tensions about, obviously, the football clubs trying to grab those women to play their code rather than potentially netball. It is happening uh, right across South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, where football and netball clubs are uh, amalgamated into one entity. And we're seeing girls uh, playing under 14 competitions. I'm sure that uh, rugby is seeing a similar situation where the girls uh, play on the same side as the boys up to that age. Uh, it is interesting. What about um, the going back, say, to uh, 1978 and uh, the Barassi effect, we call the Barassi line. Uh, Ron Barassi, of course, uh, was famed for wanting to move uh, AFL or VFL football up into uh, Sydney at the time with the Sydney Swans being formed in uh, the very late 70s and early 80s. Is it likely that um, we will see that sort of thing happen again where maybe a relocation of a NRL club could be relocated, uh, say, into Adelaide uh, to uh, see that city have a participation in national rugby? Yeah, I think the window for relocating existing uh, teams at the AFL or NRL level has probably closed. Like we're seeing at the moment, you know, the continued push of trying to get North Melbourne to head down to Tasmania, and um, they're quite successful, I guess, in resisting that at the moment. Um, And obviously, you know, I think that period in the 90s really probably was the last moment where we could really kind of push teams to certain locations. You know, we nearly had Hawthorne and the Melbourne Demons uh, merge. Um, But now, because of the relative uh, broadcast revenue that comes into our major leagues, um, most of our major teams can be self-sustainable financially. There's not too many left that have the huge debts that were hanging over many of them in the 1990s. So I think it's just a little bit too hard now to to force a team to relocate. And because most teams are still owned um, by their leagues club or the community base and therefore need to be, you know, voted to be relocated, um, it's just probably too difficult now to force a club to relocate. And it's, it seems impossible for a club to voluntarily relocate at the same time. So I think the window for that happening has probably um, passed now, unfortunately. Well, you know, depend, yeah. depending on your perspective, but I would say, unfortunately. <laughs> what about expansion, Hunter? Because the, both leagues are talking about adding additional teams to their, the list they've already got. Based on what yeah. I'm hearing you say, I, I don't think they can actually afford it, for one thing. Well, that's right. I mean, affording it's all, all relative to the to the level of lifestyle, you know, you want to live. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, the AFL being a closed competition have concerns about, you know, what does it mean for the quality of their competition to have a 19th team or a 20th team? Um, but because it's a closed competition with no international comparison, I would argue that there isn't really an effect on quality because there's nothing to compare the AFL to in terms of quality. It's not like an A-League that has European football that everyone is always comparing it to. But what's interesting is that, you know, I guess the economic argument for expansion becomes quite weak if we get to that 19th, 20 team or for NRL, you know, 18th, 19th team, simply because, you know, these leagues derive about 40%, 50% of their central revenue from broadcasting. That's really kind of the meal ticket. And, you know, as we watch football, we, you know, we love to watch football on Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday afternoon, you know, Thursday night, potentially Monday night, previously in rugby league. But there's only so many time slots in the week that are valuable to a broadcaster. And once you already have eight games in a week or nine games in a week, you know, a 10th game doesn't really generate that much more value for the sport league. Yeah. And if that extra game isn't generating more value, then you're not getting the income that you need to sort of fund that expansion. Hunter, uh, a lot of our country competitions, whether it's uh, in league or in AFL, in Victoria, South Australia and Southern New South Wales, uh, in certainly football terms, uh, are struggling with numbers due to the demographic changes and so forth. Uh, Do you see any one of the two comps sort of maybe saying, let's modify to a super rules, a little bit like rugby has done over the years. Uh, We've seen rugby go to sevens, for instance, uh, in the um, Olympics and Commonwealth and so forth games, but um, AFL's kind of resisted the change. Uh, 22 players, 21, uh, 18 on the field. Some country comps go to 16 from time to time to to field a team. Uh, Are we likely to see in these code wars, particularly in the regions, are we likely to see some change by the codes in terms of the number of players needed on a side? Yeah, it's an interesting thought. Um, You know, 
I think in, in nearly every measurable way, the AFL or Aussie rules are sort of winning the code wars. Um, in most ways, that kind of matter. Uh, if there's kind of one weakness that Aussie rules has, it's that it doesn't really have a very good modified version of the game. I've played AFL 9s. It's, it's pretty terrible <laughs> from personal experience. It doesn't translate very well as, personally from the main game, whereas something like touch football... Um, for, for the rugby codes, whether it's league or union, is quite a good translation of the contact sport. And hence, you know, that's why touch football is such a dominant participation sport compared to the full contact version is because it can still be quite satisfying to play even in a modified format. So if there is one area where the rugby codes maybe have that advantage, it's, it is probably around the, the non-contact version, which I think increasingly with concerns around concussion and injury are going to become, and, and an aging population are going to become really important. Important. So I think that's one area where the rugby codes have an advantage. Um, you know, I think how we manage participation is going to be a really huge issue because, aside from everything else, we've obviously had COVID, which means people have been sedentary for a few years. People are nervous about being back around um, other people in a physical environment. And so we've kind of lost a lot of those norms around participation and even volunteering in sport clubs. So it's going to take a lot of work to get us back onto the fields and get us back into the culture of playing sport. Um, and there's going to have to be a big rethink of the individual codes. And one of the ways that could be, which we, we don't really adopt in this country so much, is multi-sport clubs. So, yes, we might have Aussie rules and netball clubs, but in a place like Germany, 42% of all clubs are multi-sport clubs. So, you know, rather than competing in a, in a town or in a, or in a region between seven or eight different sports that each have their own clubs you know, maybe we need to think about how do we kind of amalgamate these clubs into a more big uh, unit that might house multiple sports to just be more efficient in terms of how it runs and how it shares participants. And most of those German clubs are associated with a brewery as well, which certainly helps while they have that multi-participation. So I get that, I get that. Uh, we've been speaking with Dr. Hunter Fujak, lecturer in sport management at Deakin University. The article, it was in the conversation.com about the Barassi line, and Dr. Hunter has also got uh, a book out. It's called Code Wars, The Battle for Fans, Dollars and Survival. Uh, Hunter, we could keep going with this, but I feel we need to sort of just wrap things here. We, we're going to get a lot of other questions, so we, I think we're going to have to get you back and, and go into that if you're happy with that so we can talk to you more about this topic which is not going to go away at all, is it, Flo Man? No, it's a, big, it's a good topic. It's one that uh, Hunter has given us a whole range of different yeah. perspectives, which is really great. Hunter, thank you so much for joining us on Flow FM. We really appreciate it. We'll talk again with you soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Cheers.